Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Joe. It's my second time up here tonight. So. <laughs> Um, my name's Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, I, I really want to thank everybody who is um, involved in this amazing um, convention. This truly is a one-of-a-kind convention. I've been to many of them, but no, never anything quite like this. And to those folks, many of whom, and there are many, who have gone out of their way to make Barbara and I feel especially welcome and, and for their warm and gracious hospitality. They've taken us out every night and been with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> You know, you have the speakers, and I've always thought that, that we have the easiest part. The people that do the heavy lifting are the people who start probably within a day or two of the end of this one to plan the one for next year. And I'm, I'm very acutely aware of that, and I'm very appreciative for all of those folks. I um, also want to say uh, thank you for that knapsack full of uh, goodies that was in the room. That's not a normal thing. I don't, once in a while I go to these places and they have a basket in the room. Those are always above and beyond and, and not the norm. And, and uh, every time I see one of those, I always relate the story from the podium about a convention that I was at a few years ago, a, a big convention, and they had the front rows uh, where all of the speakers were and the committee members, and I spent a minute or two uh, thanking and describing in some detail the wonderful basket that was in my room, <laughs> but there wasn't any basket in there. And I did it. As I was doing it, I was watching the various speakers. <laughs> I couldn't hear them, but I knew what they were saying. Did you get a basket? I didn't get a basket. Why'd he get a basket? You know? and we, we've talked, uh, um, and the other speakers have mentioned it too. I love our laughter. I love our laughter. And I, I shared, I think it was yesterday, that this is such a precious gift that, that none of us had when we came here. I've never seen anybody come in here smiling or laughing. Not one, I, I can't think of an exception to that statement. And uh, I commented about it to some uh, another recovering um, gal in, in, in an email, and I wish I had chosen her words because she said, our laughter to her represents a sound of freedom. And that's, you know, it's amazing that we can come here and do this. And so... I mean, we laugh at things that, that other people don't laugh at, but uh, I, I just, <laughs> one of my friends was talking one time about that, and he said, you know, this is the only group of people. I come here and I talk about peeing in my pants, and the audience just goes crazy. <laughs> and he said, I'm standing here at the podium, and I see three or four people who don't think that's very funny, which tells me they're not through peeing in their pants. <laughs> The program lists me from uh, Stockbridge, Georgia. Barbara and I are not from there. We've lived there a long time. And a year or so ago, it was kind of funny. I showed up at uh, one convention. They had me down from Stockton, Georgia. No big deal. I go to the next one. They had me down from Stonebridge, Georgia. And I, I don't care. But the, the best one was when Barbara and I were in England a few years ago. They had me down from Stocking Bridge, <laughs> Georgia. <clears throat> And, and the Brits were just going crazy. They, they said, well, where is Stocking Bridge? I said, it's right across the state line from the Alabama state line from Pantyhose, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> My sobriety date is March the 7th of uh, 1990. There are three days as I ended my drinking career that are burned into my brain with great intensity. And I talk about those, March 7th, 8th, and 9th. And I don't ever want to forget 
uh, any of those days. There are three days that to me are like the Kennedy assassination, that I can look at my watch and I know exactly on that particular day, at that moment, that hour, where I was and what was taking place. And a number of years have passed, 24 since that date in uh, 1990, and yet every year they roll around, I'm intensely conscious of those days, each one of them, and the time throughout each of those days. You know, when it says we're <clears throat> supposed to talk about what we're like, what happened, what we're like now, and I used to say what it was like, and I didn't think it was a big deal. Still don't really, and I hear a lot of speakers do that. And I get a very uh, cryptic email from some guy in southwest Georgia who identifies himself as an old-timer, and he says, um, I'm listening to one of your CDs with some newcomers, and you're misquoting the big book. <laughs> and I thought, I don't talk about the big book from the podium. A number of speakers do. I wish I had that gift. I mean, they'll come up and they'll talk about page so-and-so in the paragraph. And I re I re I've been through the big book, and I I'm familiar with it, but I can't tell you where it was. Although sometimes, uh, just for the heck of it, I'll tell you. You check the second paragraph, top page 132. I have no idea what's there, but you'll go look. I know you will. <laughs> anyway, he says, uh, it's not what it was like, it's what we were like. And I thought, oh. But I put my A face on, so I sent him an apology and said, well, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> apparently that was not adequate. And uh, <laughs> so I get a second email from him. He said, well, it's, been, it's very important. He said, if uh, some of us were sitting on the front row and you started that way, we might just get up and walk out thinking, if you're going to start by misquoting the big book, the rest of the message can't be worthwhile. <clears throat> and so... I took, at that point, that whetted my competitive spirit a little bit, and I, I took my A face off, and I said, uh, well, you know, I said, I don't think if that occurred that I'd burst into tears at the podium. Probably wouldn't rush out and get a drink. And I said, as long as this seems to be a continuing topic, let me just remind you, it doesn't say in how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly memorized the book. I didn't get any more emails. Um, <laughs> however, in the way that AA works, I went down there two years later to speak at their conference, and he was my host. <laughs> <laughs> Only in AA. <laughs> I mixed the order up. I'm going to start with what happened, because it was a big deal. It was a national attention-getter. There was a media blitzkrieg that occurred as a result of it. And that is on March the 8th of 1990, an airline flight crew was arrested from flying for flying from Fargo, North Dakota to the Twin Cities Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport, and I was the captain of that flight crew. That had never happened before. We were the first. Now, I've seen uh, those incidents that you have too, pilots arrested for going through, getting caught going through TSA. But in the years since my incident, <clears throat> they're in the news one day and they're gone the next. But because I was the first one, this was a media sensation. Typically, we do not talk about what we did for a living from the podium. So once in a while, somebody will disclose, but we don't talk about it. It has nothing to do with our journey into recovery, our walk through this thing called alcoholism and into recovery. And the only reason I talk about it is because it was the central theme of the story that drove all of the media attention. And if I had been anything else other than an airline pilot, the media wouldn't have seized on it the way they did for months and months, nor would I have set myself up for a federal felony conviction. If I'd been a doctor, an attorney, Electrician, a plumber, construction work. If I'd been anything else, that would not have occurred. So it's in the context of that and that alone that I talk about being an airline pilot. I'm not an airline pilot. He's an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic who got to be an airline pilot, and I'll talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> I'm a hardcore believer that we have no prestige or status inside this fellowship. I don't care what kind of car you have, what kind of home you have whether you came out from under a bridge two weeks ago or what. I think the highest level of prestige or accomplishment or anything that we get is a thing called sobriety, and that is the one thing that keeps us all together. 
And until I get an email saying we just broke ground on the A Hall of Fame, then I will continue to believe. <coughs> I'm going to continue to go along with that. So please keep that in mind. That's the only reason I talk about being an airline pilot. We were arrested when we walked off the airplane the morning of March the 8th, 1990. And the instant overwhelming feeling that absolutely penetrated to my bone marrow was one of shame and disgrace and dishonor. That was not who I was. It wasn't what I was about. It's not what I was supposed to do. But it's what happens to alcoholics. I've thought many times as I listen to the stories that when there are newcomers in this group, if you want to find differences, you'll find them in our stories because our stories are diverse. They're all over the place. And if you're waiting to find a situation that identically matches yours, you'll have an argument about, I'm not like that, I can leave here. This was a case of misdiagnosis and overreaction. And you can leave. But what I hear in the stories, no matter who's up here, and no matter whether they're young, old, black, white, red, yellow, male, female, whatever, is I listen for the process of alcoholism, the shame, the disgrace, the dishonor, the loss, the devastation, the horror. And then I listen for the recovery part, the rebuilding, the gift of the miracles that come later. And I don't care who's up here. I always hear that in the story, and that's what I'm listening for. Facts and circumstances are different. Some are more exciting than others. But the process is always the same. So because I was in the headlines a little bit, I got, I got an awful lot of attention. I got far more than my 15 minutes of fame. You know, I got to uh, <clears throat> the next day. We spent 12 hours that day of March the 8th. We were deposed by uh, two sets of attorneys, one for the company, one for the Airline Pilots Association. Went to two different facilities and gave blood. It was at one of the uh, facilities that a reporter saw us, three uniformed pilots, two uniformed cops, and inquired into why we were there, and that's how the story broke to the public. I had no idea that was going to occur. I did know it was going to sweep the airline like wildfire because at that time, Northwest Airlines was the only major carrier that did not have a program for alcoholic pilots. All the other major carriers had those programs, and they were extraordinarily successful. But I'd seen pilots get fired at Northwest for this very thing every three, four, five, six years, and when that occurred, boy, those stories ripped through the airline like wildfire. And, I mean, we heard about them right now, and I knew the names and the places, locales, and details as much as had been related. And we all had our own little hall of shame up here involving those people and those names. And of the millions of thoughts I had on March the 8th, the day of the arrest, and the 12 hours I was detained, that was one of them that went. And that was a knife in my heart. That, that was my legacy. That was how I was going to be remembered. I got home the next day. I had called. I got back to the commuter apartment late that night, and suddenly it dawned on me, I mean, it was a traumatic day, that I was supposed to be home that night. And I called home, and Barbara was still waiting at the Atlanta airport. She waited for four hours for me to uh, come in, and I never showed, naturally. And, and I heard my answering machine pick up, and all I could say was, there's been a disaster. I think I've lost my job. I'll be home the first flight in the morning. She didn't call me back, and I don't know why that occurred, because I was just, that it was a gift. I was heart sick. I just, I didn't want to talk. I made it to the airport the next morning. I knew I would never again fly. Never again. And I exited the Atlanta airport as quickly as I could, saw her parked out by the curb, felt like I had to climb over the curb to get in the car with her, and couldn't look at her. And we were married a long time. She pulled away from the curb, and all I could say is, honey, I'm so sorry. She's got a soft South Texas accent. She said very softly, who better than I might understand how you feel this very moment. We drove home in silence. Later again, I looked at that and I said, what a gift that was. Because what wife would not have had some questions? Her husband had just trashed a 22-year golden career. What wife wouldn't have said, you've seen this before at Northwest. Why did you do it? Why did you stay? Why didn't you go back to your hotel room? She could have asked any of those questions, and I couldn't have answered any of them. I had no answers. And we drove home in silence. She went to work, and I went inside the house. And it was deathly quiet, and I did not want to be in my skin. I just couldn't stay still. And within moments, I picked the phone up, and I called a doctor. Now, he wasn't a regular doctor. He was a Ph.D. family therapist, and he gets involved in the story here a little bit. But I didn't know anybody to call. And I said, I need to declare an emergency, and I need to see you right away. 
He said, I'll clear the calendar. And I went in. And it was like it happened five minutes ago because i got a video playing right here and I still see it. I walked in his office. The good thing about what had just happened is I was beat, I was done, I was through, I was destroyed, and I quit. So I told him straight out what happened, and I remember him recoiling with shock and surprise. He said, God, Lyle, he said, this is horrible. He said, this is absolutely horrible. This is now Friday, March the 9th. I would hear two statements that day, either one of which I could process. And I heard the first one now. Because he started around his desk and he turned and he looked at me and he said, but maybe this is what had to happen. And I had no idea why he would say that to me. I didn't know how that fit anywhere. And I didn't respond. He came back and he said, I've got an appointment set up for you tonight with a prominent doctor in Atlanta. He's a psychiatrist. He's a recovering alcoholic and cocaine addict. And he's certified in addiction medicine, which I had never heard of. Did not know there was such a thing as addiction medicine. Now, I was pretty shredded mentally and emotionally, but I, I sensed the 6 o'clock appointment time on a Friday, and I knew that doctors didn't normally do that. And so I, I picked up that there was a certain sense of urgency involved here. Later, he told me, he said, based on your appearance, he said, I was so afraid you were a suicide. And I thought to myself, I don't know what I looked like or sounded like, but those dark thoughts were starting. Barbara and I followed a set of directions across Atlanta. I saw that man. I have no recollection of that meeting. It's absolutely like an alcoholic blackout, and I hadn't had anything to eat or drink for two days. Couldn't keep anything down. Certainly didn't want another drink. I just simply don't recall the meeting. And um, all I recall is that I was there. I was straight on, dead on, honest as I could be. And when he asked me a question, I gave him the answer. And at one point he turned and he looked at me and said, Well, you're an alcoholic, and you need to get into treatment tonight. I remember not reacting to that, which was a surprise to me because I've hated alcoholics my entire life. Both my parents are alcoholics, and they died from this disease. I saw what it did to my family. I saw the destruction, and I swore I'd never be an alcoholic. I saw what it did in my native community. I saw what it did when I drove, flew around the, house, or the cities in, in, the, in the United States, and I saw them in the alleyways and the doorways. I saw them sprawled out on the park grass and on the benches. Those were alcoholics. That was my very, very thin picture, my profile, my idea of what an alcoholic was. And yet somehow in that 24 hours since the arrest, someone in some manner I'll never know or understand, deep down inside the dots got connected. And I knew I was that one thing that I never wanted to be, and I certainly never wanted to use that word. And I looked at him and I said, I thought you would probably tell me that. And I'm okay with it. But I said, I just got home today. I said, please let me go home. I said, I'd like for Barbara to just hold on to me. I said, let me, let my mind just uncoil. Let me absorb what's happened to me. And then I'll go into treatment. He said, you need to go into treatment tonight. And I took a breath and I said, okay. He gave us instructions back to the treatment center back across Atlanta, which Turned out to be two and a half miles from the Atlanta airport, and I had no idea. Of course, I didn't know anything about treatment centers. Why would I? We made the final turn, and the headlights hit a sign that was there at the time, no longer is, and it said Anchor Hospital, a hospital, a hospital for uh, alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. And I hit the brakes, and the lights were directly on the sign directly in front of me. And I sat there, and I felt like somebody just kicked me in the guts. And I looked at it, and I thought, my God Almighty, how does my life end in a treatment center for alcoholics? This wasn't supposed to happen. And I had a little quick mini flashback. Over the years, the trophy moments that I'd been able to experience, the accomplishments and the achievements, mostly against the odds, the things I was so immensely proud of, and I was no longer even sure that they existed. It was like a giant eraser swept them off, and I remember sitting there completely empty, devoid of any sense of value as a human being, no self-worth, I didn't count. I read a, a summarizing paragraph um, several years later at the end of a long report by a doctor, and he said, given the history and background of this man, it was unlikely to believe he would ever be a productive member of society. And I remember kind of flinching at that and thinking, how did he come up with that? That's pretty dismal. 
And then my next thought was, I was the one that gave him all the information. <laughs> I released the brakes and we started down the hill into the treatment center. And for the first time that day, it dawned on me, this is March the 9th. This is my 27th wedding anniversary. And I said very defeatedly, hell of a way it's been an anniversary, huh? I then heard the second statement that I could not process. Barbara said very softly, might be the best one we've ever had. I uh, couldn't imagine how anybody could even manufacture a thought like that. My life was impossibly, irretrievably broken and destroyed. I knew it. It would never again be put back together. Not possible. How could anybody think that at a moment like that? And I didn't respond. Now, I like to kind of pause here and lighten things up a little bit and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Six years ago, March the 9th rolls around, and it's a gorgeous Georgia day, and I stepped outside. It was about 9 in the morning, clear blue skies, and up this long winding hill comes one of my sponsees surprising me. And he comes in the house, and I said, what are you doing here? And he said, it's March the 9th. I've heard the story. And uh, he said, I wanted to come by and just wish you and Barbara a happy anniversary. And I said, well, come on in. So Barbara had coffee going. We sat around, and it was the conversation. It was very light and breezy and cheery. And he says, well, what's the secret to having stayed married so long? And I didn't get a chance to respond. Barbara said, mostly due to the fact that I could never stand to admit I made a mistake. <laughs> At this point in my talk, I usually caution newcomers, do not share with your significant other the fact that this is supposed to be an ego-deflating program. <laughs> because that's her job, and just 24-7. <laughs> Some years ago, we were backing out of the driveway, and she didn't have her seatbelt on. I looked down and said, put your seatbelt on. I don't want to lose you. She gave me a look. I said, well, I don't want to lose you. She said, what makes you think you can? You've done everything possible. <laughs> This past March the 9th rolled around and we celebrated number 5 1. Would you stand up, Barbara? I, um, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, September 1938, so I'm a couple of months away from 76. I have no problem with that. It's just a big number that got here really quick. And uh, <laughs> I've been blessed with incredible health. I feel about half that age. I'm still flying, hunting, fishing, climbing trees, dragging deer out of the woods. And um, I always get that out of the way because I know that I'm not the only person in the audience that tries to figure out how old the speakers are. <laughs> And um, usually I'll get it done before the hour is over. And Corey was kind of easy because she dropped two dates and I could quickly did the math. But usually what, the women speakers are the most devious. And they'll come up and they'll go, and I don't know if that's by design, intent, gender, or what. But they'll come up and they'll say, well, I got out of college and I'm thinking, well, it's 21 or 22. Um, the year of the Kennedy assassination, I'm gonna, it was 63, so I'm subtracting now. And then, or they'll say, I had uh, my first child when I was um, uh, 24. It was two years after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, uh, 68 or 69. And <laughs> she walks off the, walks away from the podium. I go, Christ, I don't know. She's either 43 or 68. I don't know. <laughs> so just, just get it out of the way. <clears throat> The other thing is, you know, I, I've just I've been so blessed with good health. I, you know, I'm, and people my age all have knee operations, uh, hip replacements, back operations, neck operations, or other parts that are medicated. And uh, <laughs> I always like to say I got all my parts and they all work, which is usually Barb's cue to jump up and go, well, most of the time. And, <laughs> I grew up in a uh, World War II housing project on the southeast edge of Wichita, Kansas, a very economically depressed area called Plainview. And it was in the uh, 1950s, and um, that was a very happy time of my childhood. We did, it was before drugs, 
Um, we didn't have any gangs, drive-by shootings. We had no school incidents. Nobody had anything. Poor is a very subjective term. And if I'm on a reservation and I'm looking at homes that have corrugated tin roofs and no water or electricity, I was not poor by those standards. But we never had anything. And everything we had was patched or broken, taped, wired. And it was a constant struggle for my parents just to stay even with things or try to catch up. And yet I was very happy there. It's a very diverse community. There were blacks, whites, Hispanics, and a small Native American segment, and everyone got along. I rarely recall any difficulty taking place inside that community. And I was a member of the, um, the small Native American community. I'm an ethnic mix of several different things. But the uh, things that really seem to like the drinking part are the Irish and Comanche parts. And, uh, <laughs> so I usually am going to have an eventful evening one way or the other. And I love the, uh, obviously, since you can't choose your parents, I thought, well, that's not a bad combine. I love the Irish music and the freedom songs and the spirited rebel songs. And when I was flying around the country, I knew where all those places were that had the authentic live Irish entertainment. And I'd head for those places. It'd take me just a very short time to get into my hotel room, change clothes, and go to these places. And I'd stay until the, until the band quit. And they'd sing all these authentic Irish songs, many of which I knew because I had all the albums and, and knew those. And I love that stuff. That was just great stuff for me. And then I, I might be someplace else, or the mood was different, or the planets aligned differently, or something, and, and uh, the other side would kick in, and I'd think, um, this would be a good evening to just have a couple of drinks and go kill some white people. <laughs> Now, Joe said that I'm Comanche and that uh, about 80% of this crowd is from Texas. And uh, <laughs> you took our land, but I guarantee you it wasn't easy. <laughs> Not only that, I got even. I went back to Texas and got a captive. <laughs> I was 14 when the alcoholism finally destroyed the community. I mean, our, our family. I never go to the podium without thanking my parents. Yeah, alcoholism killed them, and it broke our family badly. Bad things happened. But they weren't drunk all the time. And in those good years that they had before the alcohol took them, they gave me and my sister some really good stuff. And I'm always indebted to my parents for that stuff that they gave us because it stands me in good stead even today. I don't blame my parents for my alcoholism. They're not, they're not to blame. I'm aware of the disease, genetics, and all this other stuff. But I always thank my parents from the podium. Family broke up badly and, um, when I was 14. It affected me greatly. I didn't know that it was coming. And within about uh, three years, um, each of the parents had been married and divorced two more times. And I didn't get along in any of those families. Don't remember any of the people that were there, stepbrothers, sisters, and parents. I don't remember them. And um, something would happen, and I'd be asked to go to the other family. I'd do that for a while until something occurred there. Then I'd go back, and that's kind of how I traversed my way through high school. Graduated when I was 17, and um, not too many people from my area went to college. And uh, they usually married their little 18-year-old high school sweetheart and went to work for one of the aircraft factories at Wichita is noted for, Boeing Beach Cessna, and there were two or three more there at the time. And I wasn't interested in doing that. I was going to join service, but I didn't know what. And about that time, one of my buddies came back from the Marine Corps right out of boot camp. And he looked, I was impressed. He looked really sharp. And uh, we sat in a bar for about three or four hours one afternoon. And I just sat and listened. We drank beer. And he regaled me with these cruel, sadistic stories of what, of what Marine drill instructors do to their recruits in boot camp. And I'm hanging on every word. And uh, it's probably an early sign of flawed thinking because I'm thinking, God Almighty, I just can't wait to go do that. And, uh, <laughs> I was 18, and within a couple of days, I found a Marine recruiter signed on the line, and off I went. And I hear a lot of stories over the course of each year, and there are two common themes, neither one of which will fit in my story. It's true for the people who come here and who relate that to you, but it's not, not part of my story. And that is that I never fit in. When I got to the Marine Corps, I fit in. The other one is I had that first drink, and, boy, the magic happened. It didn't happen for me. It took me a good long while. I always like the effect of it, like everybody else does. But, I, you know, I hear that a lot. And I, I tell you something, I think normal drinkers like the effect. That's why they drink. But I saw some information not long ago, and I'm not sure how credible it is, but it makes sense to me. 
They said that we alcoholics like the effect five to eight times greater than they do. And I believe that. Now, that I can understand. I get my teeth into that. But I don't know that what's happening to me isn't happening to the normal person next to me. I mean, they like to dance, too, after they've had a few drinks. Not quite like I do, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, so I, it took me a while. This is a chronic progressive disease. And it, I was always in a hard-drinking environment. Eventually, I pulled away from the crowd, and I became noticeable, but not for a long time. I'm not going to do a big, long drunk log tonight. I think it's important for identification purposes, but if I get everything into this story in the time that I'm trying, then I've got my timer up here. Lee's recorded me so many times he could come up here and lip-sync this. But <clears throat> I know that I've only got another two and a half hours. So, the, <laughs> so, so i got a lot to pack into this. I'm going to tell you my drinking was like the drinks, the, the drinking stories you hear. I drank too much too long. Things didn't happen bad at first, and then they started to happen. I lost cars. I got in fights. I woke up in places I didn't know where I was or how I got there. I had many, many blackouts, many, many blackouts. I had two DWIs while we were living up in Minnesota. I was convinced they were separated about five or six years. I was convinced they were just coincidentally bad luck. Things could happen to anybody. That was my thing song. That could happen to anybody. And, and, and much of that was true until I got into treatment and I made a list of all of these pages and stuff. I thought, that couldn't all happen to one person. <laughs> and, you know, I got a good Indian buddy. He was talking about being in court for his sixth DWI before he learned that that did not stand for drinking with Indians. <laughs> You know, I get to treatment, I start doing step one work, and I thought, man, there were indications way, way, way back when as to where I was headed. But I was lucky. I never had any serious, severe consequences. When I wrecked cars, it was usually a one-car accident. And um, I never got hurt, never hurt anybody. I remember one night in downtown Minneapolis, 3 in the morning, another drunk hit me from behind. We were both drunk. <laughs> And it, it, the streets are deserted, and I'm, they're, they're not going to be long. And, and so I told this guy, I said, give me your driver's license, because you, you hit me. He said, my driver, they, they, I, I just had two DWIs. And I said, give me your license. And he finally gave it to me, because I'm going to call the cops. I wasn't, because we'd both go to jail. But I got it, and, uh, you know, that's the way I negotiated stuff. But anyway, the, um, <laughs> wasn't, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't having real serious consequences. I wasn't one of those guys that drank every night. I, I rarely ever drank in the morning. Three times a year I drank in the morning, July 4th, Memorial Day, and Labor Day. And what I knew about alcoholics was they all drank in the mornings. See, and I wasn't one of those. And I, used, I, and I came up with several tests over the time to see whether or not I was an alcoholic. Later in treatment, they reminded me that most normal drinkers don't feel compelled to do that. <laughs> And, but I, these were very elaborate tests predicated on zero factual knowledge, and I passed all the tests. <laughs> so I'm not going to do a big, long drunk log. Um, I certainly earned my place here, and I paid a heavy price to get here. Um, I went into the Marine Corps, and once I got over the culture shock, uh, I settled in, and, and I, I belonged. I fit in. That was where I wanted to be. I knew I was going to stay in the Marine Corps, um, and I was going to be a Marine. And at the end of the 13 weeks, uh, the drill instructors called out three names out of the 70 of us that were in this platoon. This was an extraordinarily intense, I mean intense experience. And the people here, there will be some Marines here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They called out three names. My name is the second one, the second name called, I, the three top guys in the platoon. I was, ama I was amazed. I was blown away. I had no idea. I just wanted to do my best. Another gift from my parents. Do my best, no matter what. And I got a PFC strike. One PFC strike. Now, you can't run the Marine Corps on one P as a private first class. But I'll tell you what, I couldn't take my eyes off that strike. Everywhere I went, I looked at Because I got 67 buddies that are still slick sleeve privates. I remember one time we had guard duty. Went to Camp Pendleton. And it was raining. They're all out in the rain. I'm inside a dry Quonset hut because of my acting heavy rank, I'm Corporal of the Guard. And I looked over in the corner, there was a first lieutenant uniform over there, and I slid my chair back, and I thought, my God, you know, I'm staying because at the rate I'm going up, general can't be that far away. And, uh, <laughs> and I excelled in the Marine Corps. I always did. I always did. Four and a half years later, I came walking in, 
And my commanding officer took me into his office, and he said, there's a new program out called Marine Aviation Cadet. And I'm drinking. I'm drinking really hard, but so are all my buddies, and, and I'm just right there with them. He said, there's a new program out called Marine Aviation Cadet. You're the only guy in, the squad, in this uh, company, in this unit, has an uh, entry score high enough to possibly qualify you to test into that program. I'd always wanted to fly, but that was reality. That was not a reality thing. That was fantasy and myth. I knew that pi people that got to be pilots had to go to college, and people that got to be pilots came from upstanding families. They didn't come out of this ghetto area I lived in, and they didn't come out of an alcoholic home, and they didn't come out of the Native American segment. I, I knew that. But I wanted to go test, and so I tested and I passed. And he said, this is a very long program, 18 months. He said, traditionally, about half the people don't make it. And he said, you're coming in the back door as an enlisted Marine because you got to go test. He said, the people coming in from the civilian side, 98 99% of the people will have to have two years college even to begin, and most of them will have more than that. And I knew I was starting off way behind educationally and that I stood a good chance of being in the 50% that didn't make it. And I said, I want to try. I went home to Wichita. There was a powwow going on. I had grown up in my culture. I knew the songs and the dances. I had been a dancer. And they had an honoring dance for me, a farewell dance. I went out and led it. We went around the arena. And the next day I'm in my car going to Pensacola. And I'm really impacted by this whole thing. I'm thinking there's no way I can come back 18 months or sooner and to this community and tell them that I didn't make it, that I'm back because I washed out. I failed. I can't do that. I'm the only one who's getting this opportunity. And I was driven with that for the entire 18 months. And there were four phases at that time. And every, through every phase, I was the number two guy. My grades were good, but I never drew any satisfaction or complacency from those grades. I never thought I was going doing as well as I thought I was. And I was watching my friends wash out daily, sometimes weekly, coming over to me and never meeting my eyes because they had tears in theirs, I think. And their dreams were over. They wanted to fly as badly as I did, but for whatever reason, they couldn't and they wouldn't. And I would never see them again. And every time they walked away, I thought that'll be me someday at some point before this is over. The final six months, we went to, I left Florida and went to Beeville, Texas for Advanced Jet Flight Training Command. If I could complete the next six months, I was going to be successful. First night in town was a Friday. I hooked up with a bunch of my buddies. We went to the officer's club, got drunk. That's another thing I will tell you. I do not remember ever drinking without getting drunk. Now, that can't be true or I'd be dead. But I'll tell you, that is my recollection. I don't remember just having a few drinks ever. When I drink, I end up drunk. And that's the only reason I drink. So we got drunk at the officer's club. It's Friday night. They said, let's go into town. There's an old-fashioned drive-in called Cane's, and that's where the good-looking South Texas girls hang out. Then we've got an inside track because we're going to be officers and pilots, and uh, so let's go. And I said, okay. And uh, I was never very gutsy with the gals, but I'd had a lot to drink. And they went after a carload of girls, so I kind of hung back to have some more drinks because I'm rehearsing some things to say. I noticed the driver wasn't talking to anybody. And finally, I thought I'd had enough, and I was, I had some, come up with some things that exceeded my normal level of cleverness. And, then, <laughs> and so I went up to the driver's side, and I thought, I sauntered up there. I thought, she may just take her clothes off sitting there. <laughs> and, uh, she turned and looked at me, and everything left, and, uh, and I'm empty, and I don't know what I'm going to say. And uh, I looked, and I said, she, I saw brown eyes. And I said, you got the prettiest brown eyes I've ever seen. Yeah, but you didn't come out right there. Yeah, I just <laughs> She looked at me like I just peed on the cyber car. And I, I turned around and walked away and left. I thought, I'm, I'm not going back. A little while later, she got out and she went into the ladies' room. And I, I was standing where I could see her, and I got a good look. She had turquoise shorts on, cute little butt, pretty legs. And I'm watching her walk in there. And I had an AA thought. I did not know it was an AA thought. I had no idea it was an AA thought. And recognized it 29 years later, though. And, because I thought, I want what she has, and I'm willing to go to any length to get it. <laughs> and I did. Saw so her the next day, chance encounter. Um, bought her some coffee. I was scared, but nervous, but I was sober. She told me her name was Barbara, and it would be okay if I called her. And on February the 25th, 1963, her 
she's here, so I won't tell you which birthday it was. <laughs> but her birthday, she pinned a set of gold wings just like these right over my heart. She pinned some gold bars on my shoulders. Hollywood couldn't have scripted a better day. I'm now a young second lieutenant marine fighter pilot. Now I've got this good-looking girl who thinks I'm okay. And so we're going to go home to Wichita for three weeks, leave, well-deserved rest. She stayed with my sister as the leave was coming to an end. I called her and said, I don't want to lose you. Let's run down to Oklahoma and get married. So we ran down to Newkirk, Oklahoma, stood in front of a justice peace and got married. And um, sometimes I'll say she was there to pin my wings on. She was there when they were taken away. And she was there later when they got restored. We joined, uh, we went to the Marine, uh, we went to California. She joined me out there. She was the youngest wife in the squadron. She was 20. Instantly pregnant, which I thought was part of my Marine Corps duty. And, uh, <laughs> we had a little boy, and eight days later we had another little boy, and I got tired of it. Eight, no, eight days later, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sitting on the on the front row and quickly corrected me. I mean, I'm fast, but not that fast. <laughs> Eight days less than a year later, we had a little another little boy, and uh, people kept coming over. You guys Catholic, and I used to think, I said, no, you're just a horny Protestants. We don't have any problem. With that. <laughs> I went to Vietnam. We were one of the first jet squadrons into Vietnam. She went back to Texas with these two little babies, and um, we were at a very primitive place in Vietnam. Uh, called Chu Lai, 50 miles south of Da Nang. It was a typical marine operation, sand, tents, hot, sea rations, no ice cubes, no cold water, no fans, no air conditioning, no nothing. And um, I was with 28 of the finest men I'll ever be privileged and honored to serve with. I'll never have that experience again in this lifetime. And what a joy it was to be with them. I put in and we acquitted ourselves extraordinarily well into some very difficult flying circumstances. I've been in for a regular commission knowing full well the Marine Corps did not give regular commissions to officers unless they had college educations and were close to a degree. And I had a marginal high school diploma, and I got a regular commission, and they were very competitive. And that is what I'm supposed to do. That's what I expect of me. That's what others expect of me. They do not expect me to go into a bar in Fargo, North Dakota, and disgrace myself and become a national pariah. That I'm an alcoholic. And at some point in time, I no longer control what's about to happen. I came back from Vietnam. We stayed in for another two and a half years, and I got out, resigned, and I hated to do it, but I, I couldn't, I, I just wouldn't go along with family separation that was going to be required before I could retire. And I had these two little boys. Three weeks after I resigned, I was in class at Northwest Airlines. I'd gone into the Marine Corps as a barely 18 year old kid. Fresh out of high school, I came out as a very seasoned, well-decorated, well-thought-of uh, Marine fighter pilot with a lot of combat time and some good stuff, on really good stuff on my resume. And for nearly 22 years at Northwest, I experienced that same kind of thing because I loved what I did. I loved the job. The flying was fun. I loved the people I flew with, both in the front and in the back. And I just, we were such a great team together. I couldn't wait to go to work. After... We had gone to the airlines. Barbara and I had talked about adopting a little child. Even before we got married, we had the two boys, and she wanted a little girl. And I, I said, well, let's adopt. And she said, okay. And um, it was tough because we had the two biological boys, and we put in for adoption, fought a terrifically difficult, hard, intense battle for 14 months, and we got this little Indian girl who came to our home when she was 17 days old. We named her Dawn. Barbara had her daughter. We were, life was perfect. We were finally, for the first time, in a perfect neighborhood, perfect career, perfect family. Everything was good. I found out that little girls just absolutely dominate their dads, and she became the center of my universe. I loved my two boys. They were rough and tumble, but boy, that little girl was something special. And she would walk across, and I'd scoop her up, and I'd look in that beautiful little face. I'd say, thanks for being my girl. And she'd say, thanks for being my dad. Thought things were good. Didn't drink every night. Never beat my wife. Never did any of these things that I thought alcoholics did. Oh, I did a lot of stuff, and it came up in treatment. I mean, I did things that I wasn't aware of. But 
when, I, when Dawn was 17, she ran away from home. I passed up, and I didn't see it coming. Barbara didn't see it coming. I passed up being captain for two years because I wanted to be home with my girl. And I went to Chicago to take a special written test. And on that afternoon, as Barbara took me to the airport, Dawn and a couple of her friends took what they wanted, left a runaway note, and were gone. Barbara couldn't call me. I called the next day. She told me Dawn had run away. I panicked, blurted out where to go and who to look and who to call. I got on the airplane two, two hours later. I was back in Atlanta. But something en route changed, and I'm not aware of anything changing. I have no recollection of any special moment. But when I got off the airplane, I hated her. I hated her more than I thought I had the capacity to hate anyone or anything on the face of this planet, and it was white hot. And I told Barbara, I said, never under any circumstances will she be allowed back in my home. And I don't care if she dies in the streets, but she's never coming back to my home, and I never want her name mentioned again in my presence as long as I'm alive, and I told the rest of the family. Inside of two days, everything that she'd ever owned, touched, or belonged to her in that family, in that home, was gone. There was no trace she'd ever been in my home. I went to the safety deposit box, and I ripped up her adoption papers. And I went to an attorney and gave him $500 and disowned her. And I tried to annul the adoption, and I couldn't. And I mean, I was wide hot with this hatred. And in the insanely amusing way that only an alcoholic can do this, I looked around and I thought, you know, I don't think she's handling this too well. She probably needs a therapist. <laughs> I got in the yellow pages, and by the luck of the draw, we got a good one. We saw him twice a month for about two years. And I didn't like talking about my daughter. And one time, as he attempted to get me to say something and talk about her, I made a statement that absolutely painted and portrayed me, and it was not a thought that I had ever consciously formed ever that I was aware of. But I looked at him and said, I'm going to tell you something, doctor. I said, I would rather hate than hurt. And he said, you, you survived a childhood doing that, and if you continue, I'll destroy you. I get into treatment, I looked at it, I thought, that's what I've always done. I don't like being vulnerable. And I've learned early on that if pain was headed my way, if I got angry enough, fast enough, and that wall came up quickly enough, I don't feel the pain because I'm angry. I am angry. And that was my one and only coping mechanism. Everything he told us came true. The alcohol quit working for me. Nobody mentioned Don's name, but Barbara said, I don't want you drinking at home because you say things that I can't stand to hear. And she was right. And so I would get on a layover. I knew every place that we ever laid over, every city, every town, everywhere. I would change clothes, quickly get to a liquor store, get a quart of booze, get back to my room, lock the door, turn the TV on. I wouldn't go to the door if a crew member knocked. I wouldn't answer the phone if they called, and I drank. And when I drink, I mix them strong. And that first drink, sometimes I have to gag and choke a little bit to get it down. But after that, I'm home free. They go down quick. I wanted that ease and comfort. I wanted that golden glow, that float away, let go feeling that I can feel even as I stand here 24 years later with no alcohol. I can feel, I know what that feels like. And I wanted that desperately. I just wanted to, to just let loose, to just not care. And from, from that point on, every time I took a drink, for all intents and purposes, I poured gas on the fire that was in here. And up came the hatred, the bitterness, the self-pity, the martyrdom. This list of things I had done for her, the 17 years of her life, and this is how she repaid me. And by the time I got to the end of the bottle, I was emotionally exhausted. And the very next night, in another town, I would repeat that thing all over again, and again, and again, and again. And I never got any relief. That's where we were when the arrest took place. I go in the treatment center, and I don't want anybody to know who I am or what I am. It's a week before anybody knows the color of my eyes. I cannot look up. I will not look up. On about day two, the media breaks the story, and now everybody knows. Everybody knows. I have no secrets anymore. I'm so ashamed. And we go in a room one day. A week to the day that I entered treatment, there were two TV sets. I wouldn't go near either one. They announced that Northwest Airlines had terminated me, as they should have. The FAA had issued an emergency revocation of all my flight certificates, as they should have, and I'd lost my FAA medical certificate because of my alcoholism, and that was fair and appropriate, too. Everything that happened to me was fair and appropriate. I'm a hardcore believer in acceptance of personal responsibility and being accountable. Let me tell you that I think the greatest tragedy of this disease of alcoholism is that what comes to me is fair and appropriate, but it wasn't fair and appropriate for her. 
I, I brought it to Barbara. I brought it to my kids. I brought it to every, all my friends. Everybody had any kind of a loving attachment to me. They got to suffer as a result of my alcoholism, and that is the worst thing I think of all. I went into a group room about the end of the first week, not intending to talk or not to talk, and they closed the door, and there were eight or ten of us in there, and for some reason I started to talk about my daughter, and I no longer had that wall of a pain or of anger up there, and I broke down and cried. I hadn't cried at my parents' funerals. I didn't cry. A couple of years ago, my sister sent me an email and said, I grew up with you. I didn't think anything could ever make you cry. I cried. And um, then I was embarrassed. It was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in treatment because I finally started to restore that full range of human feelings that we're all entitled to, that I had shut down so many years ago. There were no visitors, no phone calls at this treatment center, and I got a hold of Barbara and said, get a hold of Don. Let's put the family back together again. Don, the treatment center said, that's such an incredible breakthrough. We'll give you a day room if you can make it happen. And some days later, Don, I showed up. The two doctors heard about it and said, could we please come watch this? And I walked into a day room, and they were standing off to my left by a wall. I saw my little girl for the first time in two years, did not remember that she was that small. My two boys were there. Don, Barbara was there. And I walked over to my daughter and put my arms around her and told her how much I loved her instead of how much I hated her. And in her arms was a five-month-old granddaughter. My daughter had gotten married, and I didn't even know her last name. In the midst of all of this disaster, the promises are starting to come true. I wish I could report that it's been well and good ever since then, but my daughter's made some horrifically bad life decisions and is in deep, serious trouble right now, not as a result of alcohol or drugs that I'm aware of, just bad life choices. And we've given her ample opportunity to change her life, and she's turned that down, and we've said, we love you, we will always love you, but we will not enable you. Alcoholics Anonymous allows me to live in peace with that. It's not my way or the highway anymore. I can accept that she has a journey, just as I have a journey, and you have a journey. And she has the right to her decisions, and she has the right to her consequences, which do not belong to Barbara and me, nor will we accept those. I am... Um, immediately began to get <clears throat> word of legal consequences, none of which were known on the day of the arrest. And I came up through six ever-escalating, often doubling situations where they would take me out of a group and say, we've got, to, we've got to tell you this. And they would stop my heart because now we're talking about serious jail time, serious jail time. The only time I thought I'd ever be locked up was as a POW in Vietnam. And now they're coming to me every few days, and I can't breathe. It's like they suck the air out of the room. And I'm working on this thing called acceptance. And my counselor says, you must climb to a new level of acceptance each time this occurs. Finally, the sixth time, they take me out, and there's a doctor. And I thought, oh, they've never had a doctor before. And we go down to his office, and he said, well, I'll have to tell you, federal grand jury's just indicted you. You're looking at 15 years in federal prison, $250,000 fine, and an attorney's coming in Sunday wants $50,000. We went broke in the first 30 days. I didn't have it. He says, I have to ask if you're going to hurt yourself. And I said, no, I won't. I was numb. Every, every nerve ending shorted out. I went back to my room, and I'm not aware of collapsing. But what I do remember is my head lying on the carpet, and for the second time in treatment, I was crying. And I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't even do it one more time. I have nothing left. Not even one more time, please. Please help me. And I slept that night. I had many, many intense, life-changing experiences in treatment because I went in there hoping that what I was hearing was truthful. And I think that the only reason that we come to this podium is for the benefit of the newcomers who want to know that, is this real? This stuff we read in the big book that our sponsors tell us, that they t the counselors tell us, and doctors in treatment, does it really work out there on the streets once we leave here? Does it work in the other world out there? And that's why I'm here. And that's why I think the other speakers are here, as testament to the fact that it does. I was quickly in a three-week trial, got out of treatment, quickly in a three-week trial, heavily publicized. There was no place I could go where they didn't stick a camera and a microphone in my face. There was no routing, no way we could get to the courthouse or back. But I had an advantage over the other two because I'm an alcoholic, and I'm in the meetings every night. And they recognize me, and it takes me a moment to settle and understand that I'm in a safe place. I never shared. I just sat in there, and I listened to you share, 
And there was an energy in that room that I took to the court the next day. And a criminal trial is indescribable. No one, there are no words to describe it when they're telling the world what a no good, worthless piece of crap the defendant is, always has been, always will be. It's being picked up and paraded all over the country. It's in the tabloids. Jay Leno's having a great time. All the, then, and, and I'm dying. Jay Leno called me in June of 96 with an apology, and that's another story I don't have time for. But um, I would look across, and I couldn't respond. I would sometimes look across the courtroom, and I would see Barbara, and she would mouth the words, I love you, and I would nod, and I'd be okay. The trial lasted three weeks. The jury went out, and the jury came back. I had an amazing story with an attorney that I don't have time to go into. And I told him, I said, I'll be found guilty. I wanted to plead guilty. And he said, you can't for a number of reasons. I said, okay. I said, I'll be found guilty. And when I am, it'll be okay. I want you to know I'll be okay. I'm the captain. Everything comes to me first. Jury comes in, guilty. And I, he was standing next to me. He flinched. I reached over and patted him. I said, it's okay. It's okay, Peter. We went back about a month later for the sentencing. Sentencing guidelines were in place 12 months to 18 months. I knew I was going to get 18 months. I was the captain. A day and a half before sentencing, my attorney calls me and said, I have bad news. He always had bad news. He never, <laughs> he never called me and said, I got some good news. <laughs> it was always bad news. I'd been in treatment with a federal judge, and he cornered me every time he could, and he said, I have to tell you that the sentencing charade, uh, phase is a charade. He said, even though you're going to talk and maybe witnesses, your attorney, he said, we never change when we come in from the door. He said, the sentence is set the minute we sit at the bench, and we never change. And judges and attorneys around the country have corroborated. They said, that is true. So I knew nothing was going to change. And um, my lawyer says, the judge is going to exceed, and he's notified the other two attorneys and the media that he's going to depart upward, and he can go all the way to 15 years. So I knew nothing I said was going to have any effect. I already knew the drill. And so it was my turn to stand up and speak. And I was so scared I didn't know what to say or how to get it out. And I just said, please, God, just let me get something from the heart. And I talked about being grateful to be sober. I was grateful for the things that happened inside my family. And I had accepted responsibility for this incident from day one. I had never made an excuse. But I couldn't change what had even happened yesterday. So there was nothing I could do but accept it. The judge announced a sentence on me of 16 months, two months less under the guidelines. After all of this advertising... And it just absolutely blew everybody away. Several years later, a couple of years later, he told my attorney, he said, I was going to sentence Lyle to four years in prison until I, he said what he said, and I thought about him in terms of a human being in his service in Vietnam. And a miracle took place that day in the courtroom. To this day, the other two pilots do not know that they were headed for three years because I got 25% more. They, they got 25% less than I did. And so they got a 12-month sentence. He also did something very unexpectedly. He said, this is a complex legal case, not designed. This law was not designed or written for pilots. And he said, there'll be appeals. I'll let you three gentlemen remain free while your appeals are in play. The other two said, okay. I said, no, I'll go to jail now. I'll go to prison now. Because I learned in here that I deal with life on life's terms. This is a first-person story. So what you hear in here is about I, me, I, me. This is not about I or me. This is about we. This, this, everything that is involved in this is from Alcoholics Anonymous. Every one of the steps that I learned to use and implement is what this is about. And I said, I'll go to prison now. I've been convicted. The judge told my attorney, he said, no defendant before or since has ever done that. And he said, I was lost for words. And I looked at my attorney and I said, he wasn't lost very long. <laughs> <laughs> so on December the 5th, 1990, 34 years to the day that I entered Marine boot camp, I checked into the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary as inmate 04478-041. I don't tell prison stories on the podium. I had a lot of experiences in there. Audiences love prison stories. They have nothing to do with my recovery, but my recovery has everything to do with how I dealt with the people, the places, the situations, circumstances, and experiences that I had in there. Had everything to do with it. I usually make two quick comments. There were two groups of really, really sick people in prison, and the sickest group goes home every night. <laughs> and every now and then somebody would come up and go, I'm a prison guard. And I'm, I, the caveat is if you're a member of this fellowship, that doesn't apply to you. If that's not good enough, don't talk to me. Call your sponsor. <laughs> Second thing is, I made 12 cents an hour in there, and the thing that really irritated me was that there was no 401k plan. And, 
I came out. I was broke. I was the most. The judge put sanctions on me that were far worse than anything the FAA had done. They virtually guaranteed I would never, ever fly again, ever. A year later, he lifted those sanctions. That's another story I don't have time for. That was an impossibility. Nobody believed that was a one in 10,000 possibility that he would do that. The FAA said if you want to fly again, you start all over again from the, from the very basic, from the ground with a private license. I'd never had a private license. I came out of the Marine Corps with a commercial and instrument rating. None of my pilot buddies thought it was possible to literally start from the ground up and get back four licenses. And I thought, it's AA again. How do I stay sober one day at a time? How do I get my licenses back one license at a time? And in ten and a half months, through nothing but just sheer hard work, I had passed the writtens for all four licenses. And that's difficult. But there's a flying part that goes with that, and I couldn't do that. I'm now working in the treatment center that saved my life. And I'm working in the counseling department. I'm making $14,000 a year, just barely, barely able to stay alive. It's one of the best jobs I ever had. But I knew that I couldn't come up with the 10000 or twenty, whatever it was going to cost to do the flying. And so I was done. And about that time, another miracle happens. I get a letter from a, a Northwest pilot. He says, I have a flight school you didn't know anything about up here in Buffalo, Minnesota. And he said, I want you to come up and live with me and my family and go through my flight school free and get your, get your certificates back. I was under 13 conditions of probation. I went up to Minnesota, checked in, and I spent 44 days with that man and his family. Rained out 14 days. I flew 78 hours in the remaining 38, 30 days, and I got four tickets back. I had two of them by 11.15 one morning. I don't think that's ever been done before. I'm in an AA meeting every night I'm up there because that's where I, that's where I belong. That's what gave me my life back. That's why I was there was because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I'm in AA. I came back and I had those certificates, had amazing experiences up there. I came back and I had the four licenses and I thought, well, that's good, but nobody's going to, uh, there's no way I'll ever fly on American. I'm not going to fly again ever. A month later, those certificates came and actually physically arrived in the mail. And within an hour, I got a phone call from the head of the pilot union at Northwest. And he said, their grievance had been uh, activated. I never, I mean, filed, but I never activated because I never fought the termination. I said they were fair. They, was, they were justified. He said, this is the best phone call I've ever made because he said three hours ago, John Dasburg, president and CEO of Northwest Airlines, made a just personal decision to bring you back and put you in full flight status at Northwest. I sat there with tears streaming. <clears throat> I sat there with tears streaming down my cheeks. I, they, this was a miracle beyond anything I could have dreamt. I went back in a very elaborate, a very emotional back-to-work signing ceremony, never to be a captain again. I was okay with that. At least I was going to be able to give Barbara some kind of a retirement. That had been a knife in my heart that she signed up, went all this way, and ended up with a zero. Northwest now had a program, and I'm part of the program. And so for five years, my goal was to be the best employee they ever had. I was certainly the most visible. And I found if I just stay sober, these miracles continue. And I'm very active in the program, the airline I'm speaking next month and at, 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 uh, at American. I've been with all the major carriers. And all I'm trying to do is stay sober a day at a time and make sure that John Dasburg never has an ounce of regret for bringing me back. His level of courage is beyond the word extraordinary because if you think about it, he gambled his career on mine. If I had gone back and relapsed, with all the publicity that I had, the board of directors would have booted him for letting me come back and do it a second time. He would never have been welcome anywhere in American aviation. I could not believe he would hang it out there that much. So I'm just the risk was enormous. I went back, and as I was finishing my last year, I was speaking at United Airlines, coming up on my final year. I get a phone call late that night. John Dasburg has just changed my back-to-work agreement for my final year, which he's aware of that I'm uh, approaching. He wants me to be a 747 captain. I went back, and I checked out. And I flew my last year in the left seat of a 747. Mega million dollar airplane, 18 flight attendants, 400 passengers, fully trusted because I am a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, not because I'm Lyle Prowse. I'm standing here as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't have anything unique going on. The, th the best part of my story is that I get no credit for it. If I was unique, there'd be no room for me at the podium because you couldn't connect. You couldn't do what I did. 
and all I did was stay sober and follow the suggestions of my sponsor and the people around me in AA, one day at a time, without ever knowing what was coming. I retired honorably September 1998, and within a couple of days of that, Judge Rosenbaum, who is now chief judge in the Twin Cities, the toughest judge up there, called my attorney, and he said, I've been on the bench 16 years. I've never supported a petition for pardon. Or tell Lyle, if he wants to make the attempt, I'll support his. I'd never considered such a thing. The judge wrote a three-page affidavit that is so powerful that even to this day, by the time I get to page three, I have tears in my eyes. This is what the judge says, who tried me, sentenced me, and sent me to prison. You ought to read this affidavit. The paperwork goes in, and two years later I come in, and there are eight phone messages just telling me that I had just received a presidential pardon. If there are felonies, and this is a pretty high bottom crowd, it looks like to me. So, the, but some of the places, some of the places I go, I know that the, half of them are felons. And a presidential pardon is absolutely mega huge. I'd rather have that than win the lottery. And so I, I, you know, all of these things came, and and only because I'm staying sober. I want to close, and I want to share something with you that I heard Father Martin share one time, and he had taken it from a card that a girl had sent him, So, and I got, got to spend some time with him, and he, I was always captivated when I was in his presence. But this is the way that I think that life goes, and it's certainly a thing that I can subscribe to. And that simply says, I did not wish you joys without a sorrow, nor endless day without the healing dark nor brilliant sun without the restful shadow, nor tides that never turn against your bark. I wish you faith and strength and love and wisdom and goods, gold enough to help some needy one. I wish you songs, but also blessed silence and God's sweet peace when every day is done. My Comanche name is Yetzit the Napa. But you know me as Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic, and I thank you for having Barbara and me here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.